We're in Psalm 64, and hopefully, Lord willing, I'm going to see if we can get through 66 tonight. We'll see. Psalm 64, the book of Psalms. We, we can call it the hymn book of God's people. It's also the hymn book, H-I-M, because it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. But these were, these were songs. This is the song book of, of the nation of Israel. That's what this, the book of Psalms is all about. It's the song book, the Psalms. So chapter 64, Psalm 64. I'm titling it God and Snipers. I think we've got a little bit of loose connection, it looks like. Well, or, or does it look like that up there? Maybe not, maybe so, I don't know. Oh well, no problem, I'm going to worry about it. So, it's written to the chief musician, a psalm of David. Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Preserve my life from fear. I'm going to talk just for a minute about fear. David's going to talk about the things that wicked people are doing to him. They're saying things, they're plotting things against him. But the real problem is not the things that they're planning on doing. The problem is the fear. The problem isn't the people. The problem isn't the circumstance. The problem is the fear. And I have to confess to you, I am a fraidy cat. I am afraid of way too many things. And I, I, this is one of my growing edges as a, as a Christian is that I find I, w I do way too many things because of fear. And when I'm struggling with my fears, fear, the things I'm afraid of can seem pretty scary. We're clear. Stand by to pull her up with the winch. Pull her in. Oh! That's enough. That's good. Now you're getting it. Just slip the bar to the ring. You know it's going to happen, don't you? Hurry. I've almost got it. That's so realistic. I, I, was, I was looking at a bunch of clips of the old Frankenstein movie, and I was realizing it really isn't that scary. Re really, the monster's kind of like you feel sorry for the monster. So I had to pick something that, that you know, whatever. Anyway, the creature from the Black Lagoon. To be honest, um, most of my fears are pretty irrational. Um, they really don't make sense. If I want to sit down and, and, and think about it, it's kind of like some fears. Did you know that cats are afraid of things? Cucumbers. Cucumbers. They're afraid of cucumbers. Have you seen this? How many of you have cats? Have you tried this? You haven't tried this? Have you tried this? Yeah, of course you've tried it, Donovan. I can imagine you've tried this. I don't get what is it about cucumbers. Of course, I hate, I hate cucumbers myself. Maybe, maybe they think that cucumbers are going to grow up to be the creature from the Black Lagoon. Maybe, I don't know. Okay, enough of that. Um, too often, I find myself, I make decisions, I do things, I say things that are really based on the things that I'm afraid of. I might be afraid of how a certain situation is going to turn out. And so I, I make adjustments because I'm, I'm afraid. I, I, might be, I might be afraid that somebody's not going to like me. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to change my behavior to please the person. I'll try to change my appearance or the things I'm saying to them. David's situation has to do with people. He's recognizing his fears of them. Here's a verse that I've been trying to put in practice. It's one that I'm trying to work on. Psalm, Isaiah 12, verse 2. 
Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Because I, I think that's one of the ways we deal with fear is get down to the root of it. Am I trusting God with this situation? I will trust and not be afraid. Anyway, David goes on to write in verse 2. He says, Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the rebellion of the workers of iniquity, who sharpen their tongues like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows. Bitter words. You remember as a, as a kid you were taught, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can can never hurt me, something like that. You remember being taught that? That kind of really isn't true, is it? You know, it really kind of isn't true because words hurt, hurt very much. And this is what's happening with David. They're, they're sharpening their tongue like a sword. Talking about the things they're saying. That they may shoot in secret at the blameless, verse 4. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who will see them? They devise iniquities. We have perfected a shrewd scheme. Both the inward thought and the heart of man are deep. They, they lay snares secretly, verse 5. Kind of, to me, it kind of just made me think of snipers. You know, they're laying in wait. They're watching. They're waiting for the prey. They're waiting for their target. You know, and, 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 at, at, and then when the time's right, they're going to strike. And that's how David is thinking of his enemies, that they're just waiting for him. Verse 7. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. So while these people are trying to shoot at us, trying to say things to hurt us, to criticize us, God will shoot at them, he says. Verse, seven, verse 8. So he will make them stumble over their own tongue, all who see them shall flee away. They shall stumble over their own tongue. Interesting verse in, uh, in Proverbs 26, 27. This is a great verse. If you set a trap for others, you will get caught in it yourself. If you roll a boulder down on others, it will crush you instead. And so David's saying that this is what's going to happen to these people that are trying to get him. You know what? They're going to get caught in their own schemes. Verse 9 all men shall fear and declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and trust in him. And just the last lesson here, this, little, this short little psalm, is learning to trust God's defense of me. Um, and, 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 I, and I want to make sure that you don't misunderstand me. I think there's times where you have to stand up for yourself. I do. I think there are times that you have to stand up for yourself. You need to either say something. I think sometimes you need to do some things. I, I'm not saying that you have to roll over and be milk toast and be a, a doormat and let people walk all over you. I think there are times when it's appropriate to stand up. But I think too often with the mistake we make is we try to beat people at their own game. And um, I think that's where we get ourselves into trouble. And David is talking about how God, all on his own, without any help from David, God is able to take care of the mess. He's able to take care of the enemies. Paul writes in Romans 12, Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. It's, it's, it's not easy to do this. It's not easy to do it. But this is trusting him. Trusting him and not being afraid. Stepping back and putting it in his arm. In his hands. Verse uh, Psalm 65. So it's next Psalm. I'm up to the second Psalm. It's only been 10 minutes. I'm doing great. I might get done early tonight. No, don't, don't even count on that. You know me. You all know me. I'm way long winded. I'll be here for three hours. Not really. Not really. Not really. I won't be here for three hours. Verse six, Psalm 65. This is to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, a song. The suggestion has been that this is a song, a psalm, 
written for the harvest time, after the crops have all been brought in. You'll see why they get this idea. And it's an expression of praise to God for all that he has done and for what he will do. So verse 1. Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. And to you the vow shall be performed. We've got a, a song we're going to try to teach you later on that Dave pulled out of the air from in the archives. I, don't, I have never heard it before, but we're going to sing it anyway. And, um, but that's at the end. Anyway, it's based on this verse. Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. And the vow shall be performed. I just have to go a little bit off trail here. Because something hit me a little uh, a few minutes ago. The, I, I, one of the things I came across was that the word Zion or Tzion in the Hebrew means a dry place. And the city of Jerusalem is pretty dry. There's like, there's like one stinking you know, spring that feeds the whole, the whole uh, city. Um, it's a dry place. Praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. Praise is awaiting you, O God, in dry places. That's not an easy thing. Because there are times, we talk about this in, in a spiritual sense in our lives, don't we? We talk about feeling dry. Like I'm just not on fire anymore. I'm just like missing it. I'm not excited about God anymore. I think there's a statement of faith here. I'm going to still praise you, God, in the dry times. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to praise you. He says, and to you the vow shall be performed. I'm going to keep my promises, God. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Um, God answers prayer. That's why I've titled this psalm, Answered Prayer. God answers, God hears our prayers. Verse 3, iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you will provide atonement for them. You will provide atonement for our iniquities, for our, for our transgressions. When you begin to spend time with God in prayer, when you seriously start spending time with God in prayer, you will become aware of the fact that God is holy, he's pure, he's good, he's right, he's holy, and you are not. That is, if you're seriously spending time with God in prayer, you will become aware more and more. This happened in the, uh, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. He found himself in God's presence and he said, Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. That's what happens when you're in God's presence. You realize how good he is and how good you're not. And as sinners, because we're all sinners, we need to find out how to find the forgiveness that we need so we can stand before God. Because God doesn't want you running away from him. He wants you to stand with him. He wants you to just stand before him. And God has a way. He says, you will provide atonement for them. In the Old Testament, the truth of God providing atonement was foreshadowed. It was prophesied in a sense through the sacrifices that were made at the tabernacle and the temple. These sacrifices that were supposed to be covering sin. And that's the word that's actually the word for atonement means to cover sins. And in the New Testament, the reality came to place, came into being when God sent his son Jesus to pay for our sins with his own death. Iniquities prevail against me as for our transgressions. You will provide atonement for them. There's a hint here, isn't there, about Jesus coming. Verse 4. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. By awesome deeds in righteousness, you will answer us, O God of our salvation, you who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of the far off seas. There it is again. God answers prayers. You will answer us, O God. Verse 6. You who established the mountains by his strength, being clothed with power. Um, has anybody been to the mountains lately? Anybody? Did you, so Briar, you've been to the mountains? We went on our, our first vacation. It's like first lunch and second lunch, or thir third breakfast, whatever. We, we, uh, the first week that we went away, we went up, we went up to the mountains, and, and it's, you know, went up to Big Bear. And 
man, when you get up close to the mountains, they're, they're huge, aren't they? They're just absolutely huge. Now, the mountains in Israel aren't quite as big. They're, they're not quite the same size as Big Bear and, and, and Lake Arrowhead and all, all that. But they're still pretty good, pretty good size. And when you stand at the foot of a mountain, you realize just how small you are. I am like so small compared to this. And yet, God's bigger. He's the one that made the mountains. He established the mountains. He says, verse 7, you who, you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. It, it, now, it's one thing to be at the beach on a nice sunny day with a calm, you know, very low waves, you know, kind of stuff. That's kind of nice. We've been watching this new thing on Netflix. It's called Death in Paradise. And we, we just love this show. It's just, it's just a crack up. It's, it's clean and it's on some Caribbean island, you know, and this kind of beaches that are there, you know. Oh, that's kind of nice. But to be uh, in the North Sea facing 100 foot waves, That's what this boat is. That's a hundred foot wave. It's a huge ship already, but facing a hundred foot wave. Oh my gosh. One, one, of, the, one of the clips that I found, there's a guy laughing at it going, oh, this is great, this is great. I'm thinking, oh man, I'm freaking out. This thing is, is like, I don't mind watching it on YouTube. <laughs> but in real life, oh my gosh. You know, God can calm even those waves. They're nothing to him. The things that are tossing you around in your life, God can calm the waves. I like that phrase, I can't remember which song it is that we sing, but the waves and wind still know his name. They still know his name. He is powerful than the things that are tossing you around, things that are churning up in your life. He's bigger. He can still the noise of the waves. Verse 8, They also who dwell in the farthest parts are afraid of your signs. You make the outgoings of the morning and evening rejoice. The outgoings of the morning and the evening. That's the dawn and the sunset. So he's saying that there's some kind of rejoicing that takes place at dawn and at sunset. Um, I think you will find... If you work at starting your day early in the morning, connecting with God, you have a chance to, to hear that rejoicing. You have a chance to taste the rejoicing that is connected with God. This is from the devotional streams in the desert. I found a couple of real gems this week. Um, actually, I found my, my, my new upgraded Bible program I found I can search streams in the desert and I can find which one is written for each psalm. That's very cool. Oh my gosh. So I'm going to overload you with, no, 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 I'm not going to, I've only picked two this week. I'm sorry. This is from the devotional streams in the desert. This is what they say. This is based on this verse. This, this, this idea, you, you, are the outgo, you make the outgoings of the morning and evening rejoice. This is what they wrote. Get up early and go to the mountain and watch God make a morning. The dull gray will give way as God pushes the sun toward the horizon. Have you seen that? You know, when I, sometimes when I'm out walking early, early in the morning, and it's just like God's just pushing the sun up over the, over, uh, the sound, San Gorgonio, you know. Um, and there will be tints and hues of every shade that will blend into one perfect light as the full-orbed sun bursts into view. As the king of day moves forth majestically, flooding the earth, and every lowly valley, vale, valley, listen to the music of heaven's choir as it sings of the majesty of God and the glory of the morning. Here's from a song. In the holy hush of the early dawn, I hear a voice. I am with you all the day. Rejoice, rejoice. The clear, pure light of the morning made me long for the truth in my heart, which alone could make me pure and clear as the morning, tune me up to the concert pitch of the nature of the nature around me. And the wind that blew from the sunrise made me hope in the God who had first breathed into my nostrils the breath of life, that he would at length so fill me with his breath, his mind, his spirit, that I should think only his thoughts, 
and live his life, finding therein my own life, only glorified infinitely. What should we poor humans do without our God's nights and mornings? The outgoings of the morning and evening. Rejoice. Give him your mornings. Give him a chance to start your day. Verse 9. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain for so you have prepared it. Remember we mentioned at the very beginning that he might have written this as like a celebration for the harvest. And so this is kind of what he's hinting at. Um, you provided their grain, so you have prepared it. Verse 10. You water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. Talking about the fields. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. This phrase, the pastures are clothed with flocks. When there's a lesson here, and, and I'm calling it, pray to the God who cares. Um, all through the psalm, David is reminding the people of how God works in creation. Um, how he has, he has given them harvests. He's, he's provided them grain. He's watered the field. He takes care of the animals. Um, and if God can take care of of creation, he probably, probably can take care of you. Jesus said, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not of more are you not are you not of more value than they which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature so why do you worry about clothing consider the lilies of the field how they grow they neither toil nor spin and yet i say to you that even solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, that, did, now this doesn't mean that you don't go out and get a job and take care of yourself. Of course you do. I mean, that's, that's just natural. But you don't worry. You don't worry about how's, how's it all going to work out. All these fears, we talked about the fears, you know. All the stuff that really isn't quite rational that, I, that I'm so afraid of. God, could, God takes care of his creation. He can take care of you. You're more valuable than the birds or the flowers. He is the God who answers prayer. Psalm 66. Verse 1. I'm calling this uh, Psalm 66. I'm calling this, this psalm God's refining Verse, uh, so it's to the chief musician, it's a song, a psalm, and yes, we do think this is a psalm of David, it doesn't say it here, but we know when we get to chapter 72, it will say that all of these, this is the ending of all the psalms of David, so we think this is included in that. Verse 1, make a sh joyful shout to God, all the earth, sing out the honor of his name, make his praise glorious, say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name, Selah, which means stop and think about it. And so he's saying that we ought to be praising God for the mighty, the powerful, the awesome things that he does. We ought to stop and think about that and give him praise for those things. Verse 5, come and see the works of God. 
He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. Now, when he's talking about the sea and the river, um, David is talking about, uh, first, when he talks about the sea, he's talking about how God took Israel through the Red Sea, how he turned the, the, the sea into dry land. And then 40 years later, he would take them across the Jordan River, um, how it would, he would take them through the river on foot. And both times, God parted waters so that the people could pass through. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I forgot how to cough with my mic on. <laughs> both in the Red Sea and the Jordan River were times of difficulty, different types of difficulty. Um, with the Red Sea, uh, they've, got the, they've got the Egyptians behind them, the sea in front of them, and they're trapped. Coming across the Jordan River, they are facing the land that they're going to conquer. Uh, people from uh, uh, Jericho are waiting for them. Um, they've got people behind them, the Moabites, that aren't real happy about them. And David found that those times where the people had gone through tremendous trials and they saw God deliver them, that those were times for great rejoicing. Are you following me? Going through the Red Sea, going across the Jordan, those are times of great rejoicing. Personally, I find those times for freaking out. Not great rejoicing. The Egyptians are coming! The Egyptians are coming! We're going to all die! That's how I would do it. David says these were times of rejoicing. You will never know the extent of God's awesome, mighty power until you've been chased by the Egyptian chariots and there's nowhere to go. See, it's in those impossible times when you just, you just cannot, you don't have any idea how I'm going to get out of this. And I'm thinking I've got to freak out. And David says, no, this is a time for rejoicing. Because this is a time when you're going to see God's power. And if you want to see God's power in your life, then don't run from the difficult times. Don't try to get out of the difficult times. Because those are the times when God displays His mighty power. And it will be a time of rejoicing. Verse 7. He rules His power. He rules by His power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves, Selah. Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. Who keeps our soul among the living. He doesn't, he, we're still alive. He keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Silver, there's raw silver. That's what raw silver looks like, just uh, dug out of, the, out of the earth. It's refined and it's purified by fire. Raw silver is not worth much, but you run it through a smelter and you do the, the things that are required for purifying it, which includes melting that sucker down, and then you end up with something that's valuable. But it's only, it's only by going through the, through the fire. Oh God, you have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Verse 11, you brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. Now wait a minute, is that, did he just say what I thought he said? You brought us into the net like you trapped us? See, sometimes we blame all the difficulties that we face on Satan. And I've known people over the years, you, you probably know a few of them too, every time they go through a difficult time, they're rebuking Satan. Satan, I bind you. Satan, I rebuke you. I, in Jesus' name, be gone, be gone. I appreciate the thought behind it. I'm glad that you want to be on your toes spiritually. Totally get that. Totally get that. But pay attention to what David says here. 
See, sometimes these, uh, these difficulties, sometimes the difficulties are not from Satan. Sometimes the difficulties are, are guided and directed by God for specific purpose. So you have to kind of be careful. Pe- people come to me all the time, because they, they, I'm the God man. You know, they tell me I, I have answers of what God thinks. You know, and I have no clue what God thinks. Well, I have little clues. But I don't, I don't always know what God is thinking about your situation. And people want black and white answers. I'm going through this horrible, terrible time. Why am I going through this? And I'll, and I'll say, well, I can give you like five possible reasons. But I ain't going to narrow it down for you. Because it's not always that easy. Difficult times are not always from Satan. Sometimes God allows us. To, he, he, says, he says, you brought us into the net. Whether that's a net to catch birds or whether that's a net to catch fish. You brought us into the net. You, you, you allowed us to get caught. He says, you, you laid affliction on our backs. You did this, God. Verse 12, he says, he says, you have caused men to ride over our heads. That's not a pleasant thing. That's giving me a horrible bad boss who who's mean and, and bad and not fair. And then, you know, I don't know if you've ever worked for somebody like that or worked with somebody like that. It says, you have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. The King James says, you brought us out to a wealthy place, to a wealthy place. And I want to talk for just a second about True wealth. See, sometimes we think of wealth as being, you know, living a life of luxury and ease, and I've got $100 bills to burn, you know, and that's, that's what really wealthy is all about. That's not God's idea of true wealth. God's true I- idea of true wealth is about the treasures you, re- you acquire by going through the fire and the water. That's difficult times. That's going through difficult times. And what you get out of that that's what makes you wealthy. That's what makes you, that's what gives you value. Um, Peter wrote about it this way. He said that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a little awkward the way it's written, picking one verse, one section out of the whole thing. But the idea is this, is that God tests, he refines your faith like gold or silver are refined in the fire. And so, so trials are not always bad. Trials are good. Difficult times are good. Because that's the thing that gets our attention. That's the thing that helps us to, to, to trust God. Make, forces us to trust God. And you know, that's, that's really what it's all about. It's learning to trust Him. Here's another nugget from Streams in the Desert. I hope, I hope, hope you can chew on this stuff. This is from May 11th, Streams in the Desert, right from this verse, from this verse. Paradoxical though it may be, only that a man is at, only that, only that man is at rest who attains it through conflict. See, the only real rest that is worth anything is rest, peace, that comes through conflict. Not ceasing from conflict. This peace, born of conflict, is not like the deadly hush preceding the tempest, the storm, but the serene and pure aired quiet that follows it. Because you know that the air is so much cleaner after the storm, right? It is generally the prosperous one who has never sorrowed, who is strong and at rest, his quality, his quality has never been tried and he knows not how he can stand even a gentle shock. He is not the safest sailor who never saw a tempest. You know, the, the guy that you want um, um, sailing your boat through a storm is not the guy who's never been in a storm. You want a sailor, you want a captain who's been through a lot of storms, who knows how to get through the storm, right? Right? Um, uh, who never saw, he will do for, f- this, the guy without the storm, he will do for fair weather service, but when the storm is rising, 
place at the important post the man who has fought out a gale, who has tested the ship, who knows her hulk sound, her rigging strong, and her anchor flukes able to grasp and hold by the ribs of the world. When first affliction comes upon us, how everything gives away. Our clinging tendril hopes are snapped and our heart lies prostrate like a vine that the storm has torn from its trellis. But when the first shock is passed and we are able to look up and say, it is the Lord, faith lifts the shattered hopes once more and binds them fast to the feet of God. Thus the end is confidence, safety, and peace. That, my friends, is true wealth. It's going through the storm. Not avoiding it. It's going through the trial. Not trying everything you can to not get through it. But it's going through the storm so that you know you've got nowhere else to go, but you've got to trust God. I've got to hold on to Him. And then you know what? When your friends are going through the storms, guess who they're going to come to? They're going to go to the one who has made it through the storm. That's you. That's true wealth. Verse 13. He says, I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will pay you my vows. In other words, um, uh, and, and through the psalm, we're watching David outlining things that bring value to our lives, bring the, things that bring us into a wealthy place, things that bring us into maturity. And part of maturity is learning to keep your promises. He says, uh, I, because of what you've been doing, I'm going to pay my vows. I'm going to, everything that I promised you I'm going to do, I'm going to do. Because you know, kind of sometimes that's what we do, right? We're in trouble and we say, oh God, if you ever get me out of this, I'll never do that again. Right? Right? Has anybody ever said that? Uh, no, I want to ask for hands. Okay. But, but we do that kind of stuff, don't we? We say, oh, I'll never do that again. Well, why, would, why are we saying that? Because we probably realize all along that God doesn't want us doing that thing. And we'll say, okay, God, I'm going to give up and, let you, and I'll do it your way. Well, when he delivers you, pay your vows. Do what you promise. That's a part of growing up. Is getting past it rather than going through the mess over and over and over again. So that's not maturity. Verse 15, I will offer you, this is part of his vows, I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals with the sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Selah, stop and think about it. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Now I'm going to stop here for a second. If I regard iniquity in my heart. This is, a, this is kind of an important verse. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a, there, this is a main principle in Scripture. This is a good theological verse to, to memorize. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. The, the word that's translated regard, the Hebrew word is ra'ah, which means to look at, to see, to regard, to give attention to. The English Standard Version, the ESV, translates this way. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You know, if I'm just thinking about this sin, I just got to, man, I can hardly wait till I get to doing that. <laughs> if I had been cherishing this in my heart, he says, the Lord will not hear. Now, um, and um, there's a lesson I'm calling the lesson, pay the bill. I'll explain it a little later. I'll explain what I'm talking about, but I'm going to call this pay the bill. When my eyes, when I keep putting my eyes on sin, I'm, I'm, I'm cherishing it in my heart. I go back and, I, and I, I do way too much. And I get, I, and, and I get myself in all kinds of trouble. And, um, and sin comes with a terrible price. There's a price tag involved with sin. I have a video. And yet another cat video. So he's told what not to do.
Eating trash. I don't want to give you the wrong idea about sin because the cat makes it look cute. But I was thinking about how many times the thing that I want to do that I'm not supposed to do and I'm cherishing it in my heart. And then I'm just doing whatever I can. I just keep cherishing it. I keep at it. I keep at it. And I will do eventually get myself into trouble. And the reality is the trouble is far from cu cute. In reality, the result of cherishing iniquity in my heart is cutting myself off from God. It, it, it ruins my relationship with God. King Saul saw this happen. Towards the end of his life, he went through a downward spiral of one sin after the next. And he went to God for help once. And it says, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. God, God wasn't listening to him anymore. God wasn't responding to him anymore. Isaiah wrote, Isaiah wrote, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that, that it cannot hear. In other words, don't, don't think that... that because God's not answering your prayer that God's somehow weak or that God just can't hear you, he says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Um, when you recognize the sin in your life and you realize that you've screwed up, it's kind of like getting the credit card bill in the mail. It's kind of like that. It's kind of like getting the credit card bill in the mail. And you have a choice of what you can do to the credit card bill. You can either pay it all off. Hopefully, you can pay it all off. Or sometimes we make the choice of just paying a little bit at a time. And there's that little minimum payment thing, you know. And you pay the minimum $10, you know, a month. And you will pay that for the next 3,000 years to be able to pay off what you just charged, you know. Uh, and, but, but sometimes we choose to do that. And we're not really dealing with the debt. We're just kind of putting it off. Or you can choose to pay it all off. What we do with sin is similar. And God wants us to learn that when we sin, which we will do, we need to pay it off. Keep a short account with God. Don't carry over the interest. Don't let the thing build up and build up. Learn to pay it off. Keep short accounts with God. Now, we don't actually pay for the sin ourselves, do we? We, don't, we, we couldn't. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death and God doesn't want you dying. And so God sent his son Jesus to die for you so he could pay for you, right? Right? And 1 John 1, 9 says how we get this debt paid if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is David writing this. This is King David writing this. Was David a, a, a good guy? Well, kind of. As, as good as adulterous murderers can go. You know? He was called a man after God's own heart. 
Why could he be a man after God's own heart? Because he kept short accounts with God. And when he realized he screwed up, he admitted it. He confessed his sin. Keep short accounts. That's the idea. Pay the bill. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. It all gets shut down. There is one prayer God will always hear, and that's, I'm sorry, I screwed up. Keep short accounts. Verse 19, he says, But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. And so God, is, he says, again, God answers prayer. God is now refining him. Um, he's not turned away my prayer. David is far from perfect, and yet God, David has learned to keep short accounts with God, and he finds that God hears his prayer. Now, Dave, Deb, why don't you guys come up? We got a song on that. Uh, we want to teach you a song based on that praise awaits in Zion something or something or other. And um, Deb and I will relearn the song because this is only the second time that we've heard the song. And, um, and so why don't we all stand?
of your love for us and we can trust you even at the times when we are sensing that you've led us into the net when we are going through difficult times when we're going through the refining we can trust you because of what you're doing in our lives we give you honor we give you praise in Jesus name Amen. alright God bless you guys <laughs>